welcome back, everybody. Time once again for another episode of WVU Marketing Communications Today. Coming to you live from West Virginia University. It's a syndicated show that sits squarely at the intersection of data-driven decision-making and modern marketing practices with the one woman, the only woman maybe I know, who knows all about all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, Susan Jones, welcome this morning. I, I set you up. That's I was trying to give you a big build-up here. Yes, I better be good today, right? <laughs> better be smart. Well, you got a good guest. Who'd you bring with you today? I do. We'll let we'll let Bill be smart. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to let the good get a good yes. guest, then you don't have to be as uh, come up with as many ideas. <laughs> That's right. So, so, Bill Nevin, are you with us? I am. Uh, how are you, Susan? Oh, wonderful. Great to be with you today. Wonderful. So, Bill, you've been with the IMC graduate program since two thousand and seven. Wow, almost since the beginning, I think. And you've been with WVU all that time, I believe, right? Well, that's right, uh, Susan. In fact, I was uh, among the first cohort of students back in 2003 uh-huh. at the university approved the IMC program. And so I'm an IMC graduate, too, and then started teaching in 2007. Great. And so I've been really with the program since its inception. Sure. That's wonderful. And I understand you have a team of four in the communications department. You're the assistant VP at the West Virginia University Foundation, and three out of four of you are IMC graduates. So you all have kind of a common vocabulary and background to work together, which is great. Yeah, that's been really helpful, especially over the last few months, which, as everybody knows that's in our business, it's been a challenge. Uh, We've been in unprecedented times, but when you have the majority of your team who understands the concepts and the principles behind integrated marketing communications, it makes it that much easier. And I'm really blessed to have a staff of very knowledgeable marketing professionals who really uh, have stepped up, especially in the last few months. And that's really what we want to talk about today. You have been in the perfect storm here. COVID hit and your students were financially hit I'm sure many of them lost their jobs. Tell us a little bit about what was going on at WVU circa early March. As you mentioned, we have about an enrollment of right around 30,000 plus students on our campus here in Morgantown, a few more thousand at some of our regional campuses. But we were getting word, you know, of of the the spread of the the pandemic, obviously, in in early March. And we began kind of meeting on a regular basis understanding that we may be working from home. And so fortunately, the WVU Foundation for a couple of years had been working on a business continuity plan. And part of that oh, would, would be for situations such as this that we wouldn't be able to get into the office. And so I think we really had a leg up on the work from home type environment. But to your point, the decision was made, I think the second week in March by the university that the next week was going to be spring break, and then they were going to take another week off. And then following that, we were going to finish out the semester working remotely. And, Uh And also students were going to be taking classes online for the rest of the semester. And so when, you know, you had students, obviously, that uh, were going to be losing part-time jobs, they had to leave the area, their parents, many of whom were going to be furloughed or laid off, and we quickly began to realize that our students were going to be negatively impacted by this. And so we were fortunate to have some emergency funds that had already been established for situations like this, and we thought, well, gosh, we really need to make a push to let our donors know, first of all, that everything's fine, we're working remotely, but we were sensitive to the fact that everybody was affected by this pandemic and continues to be affected by it in some way, and maybe it's not a great time for people to make a donation. But we were hearing from people that were saying, hey, how can we help our students? And so we felt we really, yeah, we, we really needed to make an effort and to stay in contact with our donors. And so we quickly started to push some of those emergency funds that we had in place, and we got a really nice response. We felt like we needed to really stay in touch with our donors, and we did that primarily through our own media platforms and our social media platforms. We really didn't go Mm -hmm. out and, and do any paid advertising, so to speak. So it really worked out well, and we got a really nice donor response. 
Yeah, well, let's move back a little bit and talk about moving to working from home and how you all coped with that. Did your staffers, did they have any problems setting up working from home or did your pre-planning help you with that? Well, I think the pre-planning really, really helped a significant amount. Many of the folks who work for the for the WVU Foundation are traveling and already kind of have remote setups, maybe not permanently, but many of them work from, from the road. For our staff, uh, the, the marketing communication staff, we, we all kind of work in the office, but we were able to really adjust quickly, and most of us have laptops and that type of thing, and so it was not a real challenge for us to begin to work from home. I think maybe one of the challenges, our offices are, are very close by, and so it's not uncommon for us to just walk across the hallway and ask a question or brainstorm or run down the hallway to get a little spontaneous group meeting. Our staff is small, and so we weren't able to do that, but I still felt as the leader of the group that we needed to have at least weekly meetings, if not more than that, and so the challenge might have been just the spontaneous kind of things you do with a small staff when you're in an office that's uh, sure. kind of all together. But uh, really, we didn't miss a beat. We didn't miss a beat. We just uh, picked it up from home and continued to meet regularly as a staff and made assignments, as you will, with, with some of the campaigns we're going to talk about here in just a minute. But really, it couldn't have went more smoothly. That is so great. Now, did everybody have good Wi-Fi at home? I know, I, as you know, I'm my day job is at Ferris State University. And some of our people live in a very rural area, but it sounds like your folks may have been close in there at Morgantown. Yeah, I can speak specifically for my team, and I have one of my employees works, um, lives up in Pennsylvania in a little bit more of a re remote location, but she was good. She didn't have any problems with Wi-Fi, and I think most people... If they had some issues, they were able to get them resolved fairly quickly, right. either with our IT staff or with working with their uh, Internet provider. Provider, right. So did you use Zoom or did you use some other program to meet with your staff? I think we've used a combination of a couple of different things. Uh, we had had a contract. The foundation had had a contract with uh, WebEx. And so we already had that in place and had been doing some virtual meetings, if you will, on a limited basis, even before this struck. So we had that software already built into place, and then that was a plus. And then also, too, depending on which meetings you were joining, if it was outside of the organization, it might have been a Zoom meeting. But that's essentially how we met, through WebEx and Zoom. Sounds like you were very good at planning ahead for this, which I think some organizations were caught flat-footed where you guys were ready to roll. But um, clearly you realized yeah, also I, that the students were going to be impacted, as you've mentioned before. Now, did your students all, were they all asked to go home or did some uh, stay yeah. on campus? I think there may have been some students who weren't living in the dorms that stayed in Morgantown, but I know many who even had apartments in, in Morgantown decide to go back home for one reason or another. So Morgantown quickly became studentless in mid-March for the most part, and, you know, the dorms were closed and so forth. So, yes, and, and as you know, uh, our enrollment, while about 50 percent is from West Virginia, the other 50 percent really is from up and down the uh, East Coast primarily. So you had a lot of right. students that were heading back to, to various states uh, across the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So how did you find out about student needs? I mean, in theory, you knew there would be student needs, but how did the foundation find that out so that they knew what steps to take? So we work really closely with the Office of Financial Aid, and we were getting information really right away, some of it anecdotally, and, and then the university went out and actually conducted a, a survey of students a couple weeks into the pandemic, and what we found was that uh, there were a substantial number of students that were, first of all, going to need emergency assistance, maybe just to pay for a month's rent or two months' rent. Interestingly enough, there was a high percentage of students, when I say high, probably anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of these 2,000 students that completed the survey that indicated they were concerned about how they were going to buy groceries 
over the next mm -hmm. uh, month to two months. So there were a number of uh, students who indicated that there was going to be some, some issues with how they were going to carry on, uh, whether it be for housing or food or what have you. So that's where those emergency funds came in, and we knew right away that we were going to have to start uh, you know, trying to, to find ways to help. And, of course, the CARES Act, the federal mm -hmm. act uh, that uh, the government had passed, you know, the university got a substantial amount of money from that, but only a, a portion of it would, was going to be able to be used for student assistance. And right. I believe there were over 8,000 of our students who had applied and, and received funding through the CARES Act. And so after that money was substantially divvied up, if you will, then some of the private money that was, was generated would be sent out to these students as well. One quick question before we go to our break. You mentioned being concerned about asking people for money when many of your funders and donors might have been affected as well, but it sounds like people came to you. Did anybody say, oh my gosh, you shouldn't be asking me for money? To be very honest with you, the number of folks that had that response was extremely minimal, very Good. minimal. And I think part of the reason why was the way we kind of couch the message, if you will. We made it very clear in our messaging that we were concerned about our donors and their well-being and that made that first and foremost up front. And then we talked a little bit more in our messaging about how our students were being impacted and that we had been contacted by donors who indicated they want to help. And if you are in that position to help, here is the way you can do it. So Great. In, in the fundraising business, I would couch it as a, initially anyway, as a soft ask that was kind of buried maybe more down. And I think we got a good response because we weren't just like hitting people over the head with a, a request for money. We right. did it in a way well, let that me, was compassionate. Well, let me uh, take a quick break here and we'll come back. And I've got questions for you about more specifically the two campaigns that you did. So we'll be right back. Hold on. And we'll just take a quick break to remind you that this year's Integrate Conference, the one they put on every year at West Virginia University, it's moved online. Only makes sense. Marketing communications experts will still be available from a variety of industries, and they're going to explore how and what to say during these unprecedented times, like we're talking about here today. How do you reach out and communicate with your customers and your stakeholders and your clients? View the schedule and tune into the live virtual sessions at integrate.com. WVU dot edu. That's integrate at West Virginia University. And after you do that, you may want to uh, check out their new digital marketing communications master's degree program. It's fully online as well and can be completed in one year with built-in certifications from platforms like Google and Facebook. The program gives you both the strategy and the skills you need to reach audiences today through both existing and emerging media. Learn more at Marketing Communications. That's one word, marketingcommunications.wvu.edu. All right, back to Susan and her guests yes. as they talk more about how they've uh, pivoted into these unprecedented times here. Exactly. And let me just say, I'm going to do a quick commercial. I'm going to be teaching a class in that new digital marketing program. It's called Customer Engagement and Ethics. And I'm writing that class right now this summer, and it's absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to teach it. It'll be in late fall. But back to our questions with Bill, you had two different fundraising efforts you did this spring. The first one was for Giving Tuesday. Tell us about that, and then we'll talk about the second one. So many of you probably have heard of Giving Tuesday. It's a global organization that encourages people to uh, really across the world to make donations and to support a charitable organizations. And we found out in early April that Giving Tuesday was going to have a one day giving, day of giving, if you will, on May 5th to benefit folks impacted by COVID-19. And so we thought, wow, this would be a great opportunity for us, uh, as I explained earlier, to help our students and to benefit them through these emergency funds that we had established. And so, again, we didn't have a lot of time to put together a campaign, probably just a really a, a couple of weeks. We knew this thing was coming up May 5th, but we felt it important to take part in this and give our donors an opportunity to help our students. So we got 
you know, our team together, our small team, and we kind of divvied up assignments. And I have a great graphic design person who put together some really great visuals. Another person who does our social and our video stuff. And I got a great writer. And we all kind of worked together and came up with a marketing plan for this Giving Tuesday, which was a one-day effort on May 5th. And as I mentioned earlier, I didn't really have any extra money in the budget to really go out and do paid advertising. So we really relied on our earn media and own media to, to get the word out, especially own media, social, and through electronic communications. And so we promoted it for a couple of weeks. We also had our development officers, nothing like picking up the phone and talking to a donor that you've established a relationship with and said, hey, we're having this event on May 5th. It's a 24-hour campaign to help our students. Can you make a donation? And so we didn't know really going into it how we were going to do. We had a short period of time to promote it. But uh, as we found out in the past, whenever we have a need, Mountaineer Nation really steps up. And we had a significant number of people make a donation on that day. Again, it was, it was all online for the most part. We raised over a half a million dollars in Wow, one that is day. just extraordinary. That's great. Now, we were very but that, pleased. you didn't stop there. You rolled out another campaign the following week. So what was that all about? Well, as we were planning... The May 5th event, we were getting more information from the university that students were saying, I don't know if I'm going to be able to come back in the fall because, you know, it became very apparent that we were going to also need money, private donations to help with scholarship funding. And so, again, we're talking about a one-day campaign here, and everybody's thinking, well, what are we going to do after that? <laughs> after we get through May, May 5th. And so, we said, well, I think we really need to focus in and make scholarships a priority. And again, I pulled my team together and we kind of came up with this theme of we are stronger together. And I think you can use that in a number of different ways. We are stronger together as a foundation and a university. We are stronger together, our donors and our students, everybody kind of coming together. And we put together a marketing and communications campaign that we launched the Monday after May 5th on the heels of our very successful Giving Tuesday Now campaign. And actually, we're right in the middle of that campaign still. We're really trying to let donors know who want to help our students that this pandemic isn't going away. It's going to have a long-term effects on our students' ability. Uh, fortunately, we've not seen a significant decrease in enrollment for the fall. It's been relatively Good. steady, which is, is really a blessing. But anyway, there's going to be students that need scholarship funding. And uh, if, if you have the wherewithal to help us, here's your opportunity. And so we've been pushing out messaging really since mid-May on that front. And one thing I do want to talk about, you mentioned challenges of working from home. A lot of times we would be in the storytelling business, obviously, and it would be easy just to go down on campus and talk to students that are benefiting from scholarships sure. and tell their stories or faculty that are benefiting from private donations and that type of thing. Well, we didn't have that, but we did have access to those students that had received some emergency support from us through the Office of Financial Aid. And so we just reached out to them remotely and said, hey, if you're willing, would you mind telling us your story? Would you mind just recording a short video and telling us how you were able to benefit from some of the scholarship dollars that have come in and the, and the emergency funding? And, and I, I tell you what, we got some very heart-wrenching stories that came in. Students were more than happy to help us with video, and then we just turned that around and, and shared that. We continue to do that, share that content with our donors. It's to talk about making an impact and really kind of telling a story. Uh, that was something I didn't, I, at first I thought, wow, this is going to be a challenge coming up with content, but our students really stepped up and helped us out in that regard. That's great, and I'm sure this became very real when the donors saw these real people explaining how they lost their jobs or their parents were furloughed and how this put food on their table or helped them with the rent. And I'm sure the students were very thankful, too. Well, and absolutely. Uh, there's nothing better, I don't think, than finding someone who has a really compelling story about how they were helped, especially uh, when it comes to fundraising. Uh, you know, I can write all kinds of words, but when you actually have the person who benefited sharing their story about how this is going to help them, I think uh, it, there's nothing more compelling than that. And being able to share it, it gets people thinking, wow, my dollars, my private donations are really going to help people. And so right. they're more apt to give, I think. So now, 
Oftentimes, when you give to a foundation, it's more for an endowment. But are these scholarship funds going to be put into action? Like if, if someone gives you money, it's going to go right into scholarships this fall, or will it be more of an endowment thing? No. As a matter of fact, we've made it very clear that we wanted uh, these dollars, what we call in the fundraising business, to be unrestricted. Mm-hmm. And so certainly if someone wants to make an endowed scholarship, uh, we'll work with that person. But right now we need cash that's going to be immediately available. Um, and so we're asking our donors to make uh, unrestricted scholarship gifts that can be used right away to help these students. And again, we're not going to turn away someone who is really set on and making an endowed gift, but we're really encouraging people to give those cash gifts. That's great. Well, Bill, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, my lesson learned here is plan ahead. It sounds like the foundation was ready, more ready than most organizations for the challenges of COVID-19. And uh, I'm very impressed with the results that you've had. And it just shows the strength of the um, Mountaineer family, right? Well, as I mentioned, anytime there's ever been a need, I know a few years ago we had some major flooding in parts of our state. As a land-grant institution, we wanted to help our people here in West Virginia, and our donors stepped up, and they always continue to amaze me. They they really step up when there's a need, and uh, um, I couldn't be more thankful. That's great. Bill, thank you so much for being with us today. That's Bill Nevin, Assistant VP for Communications at West Virginia University Foundation. Thank you so much and have a great day. You've been listening to another great example of WVU Marketing Communications Today, brought to you live from West Virginia University, a weekly program that explores unique MarCom strategies that will help you inform, persuade, and inspire your audiences. Right here on the Funnel Radio Channel, for at-work listeners like you. 